When it comes to personal finance, people often focus on the technicalities of the stock market, the right timing for buying or selling assets, and the amount needed for retirement savings. However, Morgan Housel's book, The Psychology of Money, sheds light on a crucial aspect that often gets overlooked, the human factor. Housel suggests that understanding our emotions, behaviors, and the psychological aspects of financial decision-making is the key. In simple terms, rather than solely relying on numerical data like interest rates, Housel encourages us to explore the emotional side of money, including feelings like envy, greed, and optimism. In this video, I've prepared eight crucial takeaways from one of the most exceptional financial books ever written. These takeaways are meant to help you make better financial decisions and reach financial freedom sooner. Number one, each person has their unique encounters with the economy and money. The Great Depression is a familiar story. A big stock market crash in 1929 led to a worldwide economic downturn for 10 years. In the US, the prosperous, roaring 20s suddenly ended. Businesses closed, families lost homes, and savings vanished. Poverty and unemployment shot up, and people lost hope for a better future. While this story reflects the experiences of many Americans, it misses an important part of the whole picture. When John F. Kennedy ran for president in 1960, he was asked about his experience of the Great Depression. His answer surprised many voters. The Kennedys, he said, were already wealthy in 1929. And over the next 10 years, their fortune wasn't wiped out. It actually grew. By 1939, the family had more servants and lived in a bigger house than it had at the start of the decade. It was only when he went to Harvard and read about the Depression that he realized how badly many of his fellow citizens had suffered. Not all Americans, it turned out, had been in the same boat. Kennedy wanted to change that, which is partly how he convinced voters that he wasn't just an out-of-touch elitist, but a worthy president. But it's not only the rich and the poor who have contrasting experiences of economic life. We all do. A kid whose parent is out of work on a farm and a kid whose parent is a successful stockbroker in Manhattan not only come from different places, but also learn very different things about money, like risk and reward. Later on, we'll see this can happen to rich people too, depending on their own life experiences. Consider this. A rich person who lived through times of high inflation will see money and finance differently from another wealthy individual who has only known stable prices. The unique lessons learned from these varied perspectives influence our financial decisions. We all like to think we know how the world works, but we usually only experience a small sliver of that reality. And that's the first thing to understand when it comes to the psychology of money. We know less than we'd like to think we do. Number two, financial choices are influenced by individual personal experiences. When economists create models for financial behavior, they often use a simplified concept, rational individuals making self-centered choices to maximize their returns. However, in reality, things are a bit more complicated than this tidy notion. Consider, for example, the lottery. The average low-income household in the United States spends $411 on lotto tickets every year. At the same time, around 40% of all households struggle to find $400 in an emergency. Unsurprisingly, this 40% is made up of the same low-income households who spend just over $400 on lottery tickets. Is this behavior rational? Hardly, but it's not illogical either. If you're living from one paycheck to the next, you're unlikely to have enough money for essentials, let alone luxuries like vacations. Participating in the lottery is a slim chance, but it's better than having no opportunity to access the privileges that wealthier individuals often overlook. People make more irrational decisions than you might realize. In a study from 2006 by economists Ulrich Amalmendir and Stefan Nagel, they looked at 50 years of data from the Survey of Consumer Finances, 
a project studying how Americans handle their money. The goal was to figure out what influences how people invest their money. Their conclusion? The economic conditions during an individual's young adulthood shape their attitude towards risk. In simpler terms, our approach to risk is influenced by our personal history. If inflation was high during the late teens and early 20s of investors, they were unlikely to choose bonds in their later years. On the other hand, if inflation was low during these formative years, investors were willing to stick with bonds as they aged, even if inflation increased over time. The same trend applies to stocks. If the stock market performed well in early adulthood, investors continued to invest in it. If it was underperforming during the same period, they steered clear of it. Say you were born in 1970. Between your mid-teens and early 20s, the S&P 500 increased tenfold. Anyone who put their money into companies listed in that stock made a killing. People born in 1950 had a very different experience of the market, which was pretty much dormant during this period in their lives. Number three. The economic ideas we currently employ are still relatively new in terms of their historical development. A small poodle doesn't look much like its wild relatives, which were similar to wolves. This is because dogs have been domesticated for 10,000 years, but it surprises many dog owners when their pets show wild and aggressive behavior, like chasing after squirrels or cats. It turns out that even after all these years, those natural wild instincts haven't completely disappeared. What does the domestication of dogs have to do with the psychology of money, though? Quite a lot, actually. Why are so many of us so bad at handling money? One answer is that it's pretty new in the grand scheme of things. The first currency was only issued around 600 BC when King Aliyat of Lydia, an Iron Age kingdom in today's Turkey, minted his own coins. And that's nothing compared to more complex economic concepts. Before the Second World War, most Americans worked until they died. Life expectancy was lower back then, of course. And even then, half of all men above the age of 65 still participated in the labor market in the 1940s. Things started changing with the introduction of Social Security after World War II, but retirement remained an unattainable ideal for most American workers until the 1980s, the decade in which the average monthly Social Security check rose above $1,000, adjusted for inflation. Before that, only a privileged minority could afford to quit work in their mid-60s. That means that one of the most basic economic concepts we use in today's world is less than two generations old. The 401, K, the principal method of funding retirement, didn't even exist until 1978, while the Roth IRA retirement scheme was only introduced in 1998. Other key ideas and practices aren't much older. Hedge funds only really took off a quarter of a century ago, and index funds are just 50 years old. Even consumer debt like mortgages, car loans, and credit cards, one of the primary drivers of economic growth in the United States, only became commonplace after the GI Bill made it easier for average Americans to borrow money in 1944. If we struggle with financial planning and decision-making, it's not because we're irrational, it's because we're inexperienced. Number four, the role of luck in financial successes is more significant than you might realize. A couple of years ago, the author asked Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller what he'd most like to know about investing that can't be fully known. Schiller's response was the exact role of luck in successful outcomes. Luck is a tricky thing. While many investors and entrepreneurs acknowledge its role in theory, it's challenging to measure how much it contributes to the success of one company over another. People often find it impolite to attribute others' success to luck, so we often overlook the role luck plays in financial decision-making. And that, according to the author, is a mistake. According to the economist Bhaskar Mazumdar, the income of two siblings is more closely correlated than either height or weight. Put differently, if your brother is rich and tall, you're more likely to be rich than you are to be tall. 
It's easy enough to explain this correlation. Siblings from the same household are likely to enjoy the same privileges and opportunities. Parents who send one child to a good school usually do the same for his brother. Find a pair of rich brothers, though, and you'll find two people who don't believe that Mazumdar's study applies to their family. That's down to human psychology. We typically either underestimate or overestimate the role of luck in outcomes. If we do well, it's because we worked hard. If we fail, it's because we were unlucky. If others fail, though, we aren't nearly as generous. In those cases, we don't attribute failure to bad luck, but to character flaws like laziness or short-sightedness. Our culture, which is obsessed with success, isn't much help here, unfortunately. Forbes doesn't celebrate brilliant investors who went broke because they were unlucky and the market took a sudden nosedive. It does celebrate second-rate or reckless investors who got lucky and made a fortune, however. When it comes to money, we don't just need to figure out what works and what doesn't. We also need a way of building randomness into our models. Number five, making better decisions involves concentrating on general trends rather than individual instances. Bill Gates once humorously remarked that success isn't a great teacher. According to Gates, achieving success can mislead intelligent individuals into neglecting the influence of luck, leading them to believe they're invincible. Ironically, this mindset is a reliable method for guaranteeing failure. So how should you build chance and luck into your financial behavior? Well, here's what you shouldn't do. Obsess over the examples of specific individuals. When we study highly successful people, we usually end up picking outliers, the billionaires who've changed the way the world works, and that can lead us astray. Take John D. Rockefeller, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in history. When he started building his petroleum industry, he faced a problem. The laws of the United States didn't permit him to do what he wanted to do. His solution was simple, ignore them. His disregard for legal conventions was so great, in fact, that one judge said his business behaved no better than a common thief. Rockefeller's success shapes the way we think about this behavior. Looking back, it's easy to celebrate his vision and say that he refused to let outdated laws stand in the way of innovation. But what if he'd failed? Would we still think that Rockefeller's example is one we should follow? Probably not. At best, we'd see him as an unsuccessful criminal. Ultimately, the distinction between these two outcomes boils down to luck. A few alternate decisions or shifts in the political landscape could have changed Rockefeller's fate. What's crucial is that replicating good luck is nearly impossible. Even if you copy every career move of someone like Warren Buffett, there's no guarantee that things will unfold for you in the same fortunate manner. So here's the alternative. Stick to analyzing patterns of success and failure. The more common a pattern is, the more likely that it's applicable to your life and financial decisions. Study after study shows that people who control the structure of their days are happier with their work than those who don't. Number six, feeling envious can lead you to act impulsively. Consider a young baseball player earning $500,000 annually. By any reasonable measure, he's well off. However, if he's on the same team as a superstar like Mike Trout, who makes $36 million a year, suddenly the rookie isn't satisfied with his earnings. He desires what others, like Trout, have. On the flip side, high earners like Trout compare themselves to those who make even more. To be among America's top 10 highest paid hedge fund managers in 2018, for instance, you needed to earn at least $340 million that year. In that context, even someone like Trout appears comparatively modest. So when is enough? Just ask Rajat Gupta. Born in a slum in Kolkata, India, Gupta worked his way up the corporate ladder to become the CEO of management consulting firm McKinsey. When he retired in 2007, he was worth $100 million. He could have done anything, but Gupta was envious. He wanted to be a billionaire. In 2008, 
Gupta, a member of the board of directors at Goldman Sachs, learned that Warren Buffett was about to invest $5 billion to keep the firm afloat during the financial crisis. 16 seconds after hearing this news on a conference call, long before it was made public, Gupta dialed the number of a hedge fund manager and bought 175,000 shares of Goldman Sachs. This was insider trading and strictly illegal. Gupta didn't care. He'd just made an easy one million dollars. By the time prosecutors caught up with him, he'd racked up 17 million dollars in a string of dodgy deals. It hadn't made him a billionaire, but it was enough to earn him a hefty prison sentence. The lesson here is that making decisions based on envy can lead to negative consequences, and the drawbacks of such decisions outweigh the potential gains. Consider it like having an insatiable appetite. You might eat until you're sick. However, the aftermath of getting sick is far worse than the satisfaction from any meal, so you avoid overindulging. Similarly, passing up certain opportunities doesn't necessarily mean you're losing out. It often signifies the wisdom of avoiding excess that could lead to later regret. Number seven, accumulating wealth is simpler than retaining it. There were few better stock market traders in early 20th century in America than Jesse Livermore. Born in 1877, he played a significant role in shaping Wall Street. By the age of 30, his wealth amounted to $100 million in today's currency. Just before the 1929 market crash, Livermore made a pivotal decision. He took a short position, betting that stocks would decline. His prediction proved accurate, with the market losing a third of its overall value. While others faced financial ruin and reports circulated of bankrupt investors jumping from office windows, Livermore went home to his family with remarkable news. He had just earned the modern equivalent of $3 billion. Happy ending? Not quite. Well, after his big win in 1929, Livermore thought he was untouchable. He placed larger and larger bets and lost big again and again until his fortune was gone. Broken and debted, he took his own life in a Manhattan club in 1940. Getting rich is sometimes easier than staying rich. People good at making money often struggle with keeping it. Making money involves taking risks and being optimistic. While keeping money is a different game that includes the fear of losing it and requires humility. There are lots of Livermores out there, though their stories aren't usually as tragic. Around 40% of all publicly listed companies lose their entire value over time, and the Forbes 400 list of America's richest people has a 20% turnover per decade, excluding cases of death and intra-family transfers. So how do you keep what you already have? In one word, perseverance. The entrepreneurs who do best stick around for a long time without wiping out. What they all have in common is a little thing called fear. According to billionaire venture capitalist Michael Moritz, when you're afraid of losing, you see potential rewards differently. Not many gains are worth risking everything you already have. When you adopt this perspective, you're more likely to make smarter decisions. Number eight, even if you're wrong half the time, you can still become wealthy. Heinz Bergruen didn't seem very promising in his early years. When he had to leave Nazi Germany in 1936, he wasn't sure what to do with his life. After studying literature in California, he worked as a journalist and started liking modern art in 1940 when he bought a small painting by Paul Klee for $100. That sparked his lifelong passion for art. In 1990s, Bergruen had become one of the most successful art collectors of all time. In 2000, he sold his collection to the German government for 100 million euros. Given that it contained a large number of Picassos, Cleese, Matisses, and Braque, that figure was nowhere close to its real worth, which was estimated at $1 billion. It was one of the most important collections in the world. How did Bergruen amass this impressive collection of the 20th century's greatest artists? Was it skill or just luck? 
According to Horizon Research, successful art collectors have a simple strategy. They buy a lot of art. Some pieces turn out to be great investments if held for a long time, but most are not that valuable. The trick, as Horizon suggests, is to keep the valuable ones until the overall collection's value matches that of the best pieces in the collection. Bergruen's collection was a bit like an index fund. His risks were evenly spread across a wide range of investments. Rather than just buying pieces he happened to like or admire, he bought everything he could get his hands on and waited until a few winners emerged. This strategy applies to all investments. Call it the long tail, the tendency of a small number of events to account for the majority of outcomes. There's a lot of complicated math behind this principle, but it's simple enough when you boil it down to the essentials. In simple terms, if you get some things right, you can handle making mistakes. Failure is bound to happen. But what truly counts is the kind of successes you achieve. To put it another way, when you own a valuable item like a Picasso, you don't need to be concerned about the 99 less valuable items in your collection. That was it for this video. Thank everyone for watching. If you find it helpful, please leave your like and subscribe to my channel.